The wall has changed. That's the beginning of the first Lord of the Rings movie. And, and it's true, it's changed, and we didn't realize, and we're trying to catch up. Um, we know that running in mutable and ephemeral infrastructure is really good, and it's really hard, as we have experienced. And it's basically, we don't like change. People really struggle with change. Some of us, we are okay with learning and changing, but most of the people in big companies struggle a lot with change. I'll tell you about what I call the Jenkins incident. We know that, that it's now we say you build it, you own it. Well, we had this situation where a developer um, sent me in Slack, so like, the bill for this app is broken. Can you look at it? And then I was busy doing something else, like, well, you know, you build it, you own it. <laughs> and his response was like, well, actually, it's Jenkins who is building it, so it's Jenkins' problem. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So when, when I talk about DevOps, especially in, in, in the group that, that I am in, in Home Office Digital, um, we talk about transformation. It's not about config management. It's not about continuous delivery. It's about changing. And changing is hard. My name is Ivan. If you are English speaking, you will say Ivan. I'm OK with both of them. Um, my background is development. I'm not a sysadmin. I always say that. I'm not a sysadmin. Um, I was a developer, an architect, then I fell in the dark side of operations for a while, and then I became DevOps, helping companies to reach that speed that we need. And now I'm the home office, where we run Kubernetes. And I, forgot, I knew that I was going to forget that, but um, in, the, in the home office, we run Kubernetes in production. This was going to be me doing a poll in Twitter. So I was going to ask you, like, who of these three options, which of these three options do you think it's me doing this process? <laughs> now, I forgot to put the poll in Twitter, so we cannot do it. But, um, well, <laughs> see, like, OK, do it with hands, like A. My daughter is going to be very disappointed. <laughs> B. OK. C. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so as I said, we, I work in the home office. Um, and we do a lot of things in the open. We are hiring if anyone wants to become a civil servant working in DevOps and work for the country and or the empire, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Barcelona, I'm, I'm, I'm not English. My wife is English. And, and this, this thing that I was talking about, change is, is important. Like British and Spaniards are very different. And if you like, something happens, Spaniards will react like, Oh no, we missed a train. Oh, oh no, the flight is delayed. It's the end of the world. And then my wife would be like, yeah, it's very inconvenient. <laughs> if she watches this video, I'm, I'm dead. But <laughs> <laughs> so we have this public repo. Well, we have loads of repos in GitHub. And it's another thing that happened that when you come to work with us, and if you are doing something that is not confidential, or yeah, let's put it confidential. You, you will basically put your code there. And it's something that the developers will say, hold on, hold on. You're saying that my, my code is going to go to GitHub and everybody will see it? Yes. But that's, that's only important for the home office. They're like, nobody cares. Well, you know, it's OK. We want to put it there. Because it's about being open and people can see. <coughs> so we have lots of stuff. And I will be showing a few projects that we have that are really handy. Um, the stuff that we cannot put there, because I cannot confirm more than I if we have Aston Martins with buttons. I can confirm that I have a few bicycles. 
that's it. Um, GDS. <coughs> if you're not from UK, you probably don't know what GDS is. Is um, the government digital service. Last month they announced the Spring 16, and they was like all oh, transforming the government together. And I thought, well, I can use that as the title of my talk. <sighs> they are doing a lot of things to to modernize the government. We are trying to change the way of doing things. And as I said at the beginning, change is hard. So if you just have to take something from today, it's this, it's all about people. It's technology is important, but most of the time you will be having issues and problems and success because of the people. In this startup, we always talk like people is a very important thing. My wife is the CFO of an investment group, and, and they always talk about, oh, the team, the team, the team. So it is true, not only in the startups, everywhere. It's about the team, it's about the people. If you have a big team, you have lots of people, it becomes a really difficult bit. Managing people is always hard. So it's, it's, it's the story of a journey that we started a while ago. And I was trying to find a good example about how it, it represents the change that we've done from before Kubernetes and after Kubernetes. And then um, originally I was going to do this talk with, with Billy Thompson, but she had to pull out because um, she's not feeling very well. I, I'm, I'm Spanish, so all my, all my prepositions are always wrong. And, well, yeah. So this live verification um, event application was going to be like, like, like a wonderful thing for all of us who suffer the, these kind of things. You have your child and you have to get the passport and then you go there and say like, well, I want the passport for my, for my baby. And they say, okay, you have to bring the birth certificate and you have to bring me your passport and you have to bring the passport of your wife. And, and, it's, and you say like, fine, but you know what? You have all these things. You already have them. So you have to go physically and get all these copies and then take them and they could do it. So LEB is basically the application that will help you to collect all these things digitally and then you don't have to do all these issues. And LEB was very classical three tire application. <sighs> and 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 this application has been going for, for years and we have all these flavors and it, it must be like this, it must be like that with very funky ones or very classical childish. But it doesn't really matter. It's at the end it's always the same. The idea was to use Drop Wizard, and it was because it's Java. Java is good. <laughs> and, and, but Drop Wizard has the ability to, to speed up metrics. So when the people decided to use that stack, they were looking about, well, we, we will have this problem. We will try to solve it somehow. And Oracle, of course, because it's the enterprise. And then we had to put, because home office is, security is very complicated, but in the home office is even more complicated. We had to put firewalls and deal with firewalls and security rules and stuff. So we create these, these WAFs and we create this container, which is basically an NGINX that use Naxi rules. If you don't know that, it's basically, you can run this NGINX and it will protect your application or, you, or, you, or whatever you're proxying through NGINX from cross-siting scripts and, and SQL injections. So it was a, a very good way to standardize how we're going to block any application if we put um, an, a WAF in front. So it's a container. If you want to find, find out more about this, just go on the links. And I think the, all the links are at the, at the very end of the presentation. Um, so it will be easy. And if you don't know anything about Naxi, you can just follow the links and, and learn a little bit more. So, well, they did this, and it was it was it was hard. It was basically containers running in System D, managed with Ansible, and there were lots of problems. And Billy described the problems using this sentence and I decided to keep it because I think that, that that's basically something that people miss is if you have environments, you're not building an application. You're not building and running an application. You're building and running an application per environment. So suddenly your team is not in charge of one application, in charge of like if you have dev 
integration test, UAT, pre-prod, and prod, you have five, you have several applications. And managing those environments were becoming more and more difficult. And, you sp and, and, and Billy was saying, like, oh, we spent so much time trying to automate and, and improve this environment management, which was really hard. Right, so, and this is a bit that we always forget when we do all the planning and all the architects, like, well, who's going to run this and how are we going to run it? Because one thing is the theory, the idea, and the other one is the implementation and what we have and how it works. And if you don't know Simone, I really, really recommend you to watch her videos because they are really, really good. So the team knew and wanted to have cattle, but they didn't really get there. They basically end up with, I call it a farm of pets. I think that yesterday was saying pet set or something like that. But yeah, it is basically all these little things that, yeah, it's not exactly that I can kill one and, you know, if I kill one of these, my children will be really upset. <laughs> I will be very upset. So, in the meantime, we were building a platform based in Kubernetes, and it runs CoreOS, and it's one region, three assets. And, and the idea of the platform is that you will be able to use it and forget about all these problems that, that Bill's team had. Especially in our team, we run everything in containers, everything. <laughs> From the application to the integration test, backups, anything you have to do, you do it through a container. When I have to request for holidays to my boss that is there, I always create a container and ship it to him. <laughs> Docker run my holidays, yeah. <laughs> so the idea of, of building this platform was basically um, focus teams can focus in doing what they have to do, which is basically deliver the application. That is the important thing. Write less, deliver more, because there are a lot of things that are common. And we, I've just been in the talk uh, of Pearson, and they were basically talking about something, so that they've done a lot of things that are very similar. We know that we are lots of people working in the same place and across the government we have a humongous amount of developers and project managers and teams and and we have to improve the way that we share. Sharing is really hard. Is reusing stuff it's really hard. And we will see an example of why it becomes so difficult. And as usual the challenge in these kind of situations is adoption and I'm sure that all of you regardless of, of where you work a startup building a really cool app or pass or even if you're in the enterprise the main issue that you have is adoption because for people to gravitate towards your platform app or whatever you have to basically offer something Netflix wrote a really good blog post, and um, I was very keen on going and, and get it and use it. Because I think it's, it's very important to understand. It's, a, it's all about value. And I always say to, to in, in my team, there's a lot of um, ops guys. It's like, well, you cannot push them. If you have to go and say, like, you have to use my platform, you will create a lot of friction. And friction is really bad. So it's about what we offer, and they have to see it. Uh, I spend a lot of time trying to evangelize a platform internally, and, and it's really hard. You have to get into the mindset of, of the team and understand that teams are particularly different. It is about this fight of projects versus products. It, it's the, the the idea is different because a project wants to deliver, but when you're building a product, you want to create something. It is not that much about time. Product has to be on time, as my wife will tell you if she's in the investment board. Um, but 
the key element is that I'm building something, I'm delivering something. It's slightly different. Okay, let's let's focus on the on the platform. What what the platform provides? <coughs> we have a place where you can run you your application. We have a normalized, standardized um, way of dealing with security. Security for the home office is, is very important, and you cannot just go and say, I'm going to run this. You have to follow a, pro a procedure. You have to be, the accreditation process, it's, it's very long and painful. Monitoring, again, it, this, this was one of the reasons why they chose Drop Wizard and Java and in LEB. Now we have to have a standard way of, of doing all this and gathering metrics and, and displaying metrics and helping people to use it and, and logging. It is, it is just logs, logs. I was talking with someone um, yesterday and said, yeah, but logs, the value of logs are a little bit like this. Yeah? It's like sometimes they're very important. It's you have a problem, you need to go and check the logs, but if not, you just like, creating logins and of course CI and CD because it's not only writing code it's about building it and delivering it and and I spend a lot of time trying to find a way of removing friction um, I gave a talk about about how we do CI and CD but I'll, I'll, I'll say just that we have these two guys Jenkins and Drone we run everything in containers so it's basically in, in an auto scaling group that runs Docker host that will run your container and then they will push the image to the registry and the classes will go and pull from that registry, blah, blah, blah. We have, that's the idea. Um, everybody knows Jenkins, but maybe not everyone knows Drone. We have Drone because Drone uses Docker. Um, so everything that you run in Drone will run in Docker. To use drone, you just need this file, the drone YAML. So you have your Docker file, your drone, and you're good to go. We have as well this cube, which is basically the deployment artifacts that we need, the replication controller and the service if you need one. But, but the key thing is that developers working in LEV, in LEV, they have how it's built, test and deployed in one file in the project. So suddenly the, the distance between my code and my build and deployment artifacts are very close. And that makes things like it is not my problem go away because suddenly it's part of your code. So it's not ops thing, it's depth thing to deal with this. However, <laughs> We know that a simple deployment script will not always work. We have legacy apps and we have a lot of complexity, so we have this other tool that I call Cubator, and they always correct me because it's not Cubator, because it's Kbator, or what is this? But, and, this, and this app will manage your deployment. It will read environments and will know, oh, you're doing this in dev, then you're doing this in integration tests, you're doing this in UAT, and it will play and, and change all the environments and set these and set all the secrets, etc. Again, it's, it's open source. You can find it in, in the GitHub. And I'm very excited about the deployment. That I think that in the other room, the guys from Days are, are announcing now that something is happening with deployment. Um, but it's changing. The way we deploy in Kubernetes is, is quite painful. And we saw Kelsey yesterday doing all these command line things. Well, if I need my developers to sit down and start just doing all these commands, this is not going to work, right? So deployments in Kubernetes are changing, and uh, it's, it's one of the things I'm really excited about, like, finally, we have automated deployments. That, because it's complex. You, you, you have something like, I'm going to do a rolling update, but now I don't want to do a rolling update. I want to do something different. I want to go and deploy and have both systems at the same time. And I, So yeah, it's this. Life is not just one line, it's like it is black or it is white, it's, it's complex. So what have we learned? Fire is dangerous. <laughs> 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 
composition, 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 over and over. Um, from the architecture point of view, we know that composition is very important. It is, it is the big discussion about um, inheritance and composition, and, and it's been very long discussions, but from the operational point of view, composition is much better because it gives you the flexibility of rearranging things very quickly. Just that is very important. So Kubernetes, in our experience, it helps us to run the platform, and it helps all the developers and all the architects to change and write applications slightly different. But new concepts are difficult. We do multi-tenancy using namespaces, and that's that's hard to understand. I have a project manager like, I need my pre-prot environment because I need to do my test. And I said, well, you don't need a pre-prot environment. What we have is this namespace, and we have all these resources here, and then you just have to write in the classic, but I need my machines. No, you don't. And the idea of namespace and, or virtual cluster, or it, it is complex, and it, you, it's, it's it's the bit that you have to understand. It's like it can be very good for you and very natural, but, but people will struggle. So you have to be patient and you have to help them to reach that point, show them why it is good and why it's the same. I knew that I had to do this. Well, if, if you have teenagers, how of you have teenagers at home? One. Okay, so <laughs> not many of us, but we know if you if you have a fridge full of full uh, full of food and you leave and leave your teenagers at home, when you come back, you get this. <laughs> so if <laughs> it is true, <laughs> my wife's like they just eat, they just eat. I don't understand. <laughs> um, so it's the same thing in Kubernetes. If you don't limit your resources, you will end up with this and with problems. And, and usually when a cluster has problems, is because there's problems with the resources that someone is not managing properly or someone has abused the resource pool. The other thing is test. Testing changes. When you are in Kubernetes, change, you, have this, this, you have to understand that you have to do things differently. And testing is, is one of those things that changes primarily because you run containers that are going to do your tests. So in drone, for example, we run this test that happens in a container, which is very good because you're basically turning your test into microservices. The integration test, for example, it becomes a microservice, which happens to be like a blueprint. Um, as I said, I'm not English. I'm a Spanish. Blueprint is a very polite way of saying copy and paste. <laughs> so we have, for example, this test. So we deploy Mongo, and suddenly we want to test that the deployment has gone well and that people can use it. So we have a container that runs that, that test. Right? But this Mongo has been configured in a specific way. We have SSL, we have SSL everywhere. And we have the authentication. So we have, I think that I have, so we have a sidekick container, and the guy in, in Pearson was talking about something similar, so you can, you can go into our GitHub and, and, and see what we have. It's basically a container that will be in charge of going to your Bolt. We use Bolt as well to manage all the secret certificates. So this container will go there and renew your certificate, or it will go and get your credentials. Let's go there, right? So that's what we, we have here. And then your test is basically using these credentials that you mounted there to authenticate against this MongoDB. Right? So suddenly, you have a template that people can go and, and, and they can run this if they want. They go to their namespace and they can run this and say, oh, well, this integration test is, is passing, so I know that if something is not working, it's in my code. And, and it happened to me, so we have this MongoDB, and everybody's like, well, it, it is not working. It, well, then the problem must be in your side because we have this test that guarantees that it's working. 
and said, no, it's not in my site because I know my code and I have my unit test and my code is fine and it was in the code and it was the database. Yeah, that's why I put it there, because it's, it's this kind of thing that, yeah, well, try it, and try it with this configuration, and if it works, well. The other thing is health checks. Usually, health checks are an ops thing, not a depth thing. However, developers know the conditions that you need to have to be able to select my application is healthy. In systems, in complex systems like Documentum, you have a lot of tiers, uh, levels, whatever. And one thing that happens is if operations control the health check, they will say, yeah, everything is green, the web suite is, is working, database is fine, everything is fine. And what happens is the application suddenly loses the connection with the database and nothing works. And I so, say, well, from the ops point of view, everything is fine. From the user point of view, nothing is working. Right? So suddenly we have a way of like the developer will define the health check, not, not the op operator. So we have this health check here that basically checks if the certificate expires. So the idea is that my sidekick will go and fetch my certificate. When the pod starts, we have these two containers, sidekick and Mongo, for example. So Mongo starts and says, oh, I need this certificate, I will wait. Because Kubernetes goes and runs the other sidekick container and says, well, I'm going to go and fetch this certificate with these conditions. I will put them in this, in this volume. And then Mongo says, oh, I have, I have my certificates. I can start um, serving requests. Um, Kelsey was talking yesterday about the readiness probe. It's a very good example of you can have your health check and your readiness like, now, now I'm ready. What happened was that we had all these projects running different things that use certificates, and all of them had their own way of dealing with, with that. It was with Bash, or it was with Java, but all of them were doing something particular that it was basically go to this place, get my certificate, and if the certificate expires, do something else. Now what we've done with this, with this model of having the sidekick container and health checks is like, you know what? Your container, your Mongo container does what Mongo container does. It's, it's all the same for everyone. What we have is a standard way of going and fetching this. This, this action that you want to have in all these applications on that common, you have them there. So the idea of pod starts to make more sense because when we, when we give the workshops about Kubernetes, we always have these, these problems that people struggle to understand the idea of pod. Because they're like, well, it's a bunch of containers playing together. Well, you have an example here that is, is defining what the pod is and how it works. Like, we will have different run times. We'll have different processes running together, but they have to run together. I need something that will go and grab my certificate, and I will need something that runs and uses that certificate, and they are two different things. And if you don't use this, this approach, what happens is that you start polluting and, com and compromising the shareability and reusability of your container. And that is OK if you're in a project because it's about me delivering, but it's not OK from the platform point of view because you are doing this, and they are doing something very similar, and we could share it, but suddenly we can't because your project is going to this vault and using these keys in this way that doesn't work in my project, so I will have to do it again. So we talk about secrets and certificates, and we know that it's messy <coughs> because things get tangled. I don't know if you know the character is from the Tangled movie. I see like 300 times. <laughs> <laughs> so the concept is basically do one thing and do it well. That is the, the message, right? Well, when you write your code, try to do only one thing. And if you have to do something else, that is a smell. It has to tell you, like, maybe there is a different way of doing it. Think about how you can break up this, this process or this concept. Maybe using two containers are the right thing. Maybe you just need one that, that has a call to another service. It depends. We know that composition is very important, and we've seen that when we go to a project and start just applying this concept, things speed up dramatically, right? And just been moved to another project, and, and we start using this thing about ch changing the certificates and, and trying to reorganize the 
way of running things and composition has become really powerful in the sense that, okay, we just have to remove all this code and just run everything together and change the replication uh, controllers. And so what we're doing basically by using these little bits of code is removing the technical debt that we have always in all our projects. And I don't really know what this guy was thinking. <laughs> But, but, that's exactly what you think when you're going through someone else who's like, what is this? Anyway, in summary, Kubernetes helps you. It is true, it's hard to start and it's hard to convince people to start using it and it's a little bit different, but it, in the long run it will help you. And in this transition from the old world to the new world, in this transition like people going and start using um, Kubernetes, you will find these two things. One is that you go to this project and they say, no, <laughs> it works. And it works because there's, there's this guy who is very talented doing this thing that if I have to do, I will not do it. <laughs> I mean, I would probably be there. and. <laughs> And then I will be in a different place. <laughs> that is. The other thing is this. Oh, it works. We've been, we've been there. We all have been there. All these applications that, oh, yeah, yeah, it was well, OK. Let's run it in containers. <laughs> OK. So the migration into Kubernetes helps you to make better architectures and make the applications more solid. Re, how do you say it? Um, Proact? Uh, I don't know. Resilient. It's about speed. It's about being able to deliver fast. We know that. There's another thing. It's Kubernetes goes very fast. So, things that we have done, for example, the incubator thing, we know that is something that hopefully in the future we will not need. So, so you have to think about what is coming, right? We have these releases of Kubernetes that, that they are really, really fast. So 1.2 is going to bring lots of good things, and 1.3 is going to be ben, bring more. Right? So if you are going to do something that, that it's coming, think about how long it's going to take you, and the technical depth that you're putting in your project by doing that. Because maybe it's like, well, you know what? It's better to hold off until 1.2 or 1.3 is out and invest all my energy in doing something is more convenient. But we're, yes, we will not be able to do it until 1.3 is out, but we will be doing something else because it's very unlikely that you will do the same thing that the guys from Kubernetes are going to do. And it's basically getting technical depth. So if you have to do it, do it, because we have done it. But think about what are you doing. If you're building a path, think about all these little things. And I think that that's all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Evan. Uh, very, very good. Um, questions for Evan? <coughs> Hi. A um, number of questions. You do imply you're using AWS for your deployment. Yes. Right. Did you, what kind of challenges did you have? getting that signed off, because last time I checked, they weren't compliant to any security level, or IL-3 and old money, but is that a problem for you? And the second part question is, what are you doing with your networks to secure that? Are you using Flannel? So, let's see, we, we're doing, so all the work that we've put in, in the platform is basically getting it in the way that, that the home office wants to run it. So it's putting lots of security everywhere, right? That is basically what we do. Running Kubernetes is not very hard. Keep up, um, but running it the way that you want it's a little bit more complicated, especially if you are uh, the home office. We have accreditation processes, and we have to make sure that everything is compliant. But yeah. Um, I think that's that's what I can say. We use flannel, um, but yeah. 
I saw other hands before. Yeah, it's just <laughs> So the question is, if, if we run things locally, I don't have a Mac. It looks like a Mac, but it's not a Mac. <laughs> um, it, it's up to the people to, to do it. Right? Um, developers usually want to develop and don't worry about Kubernetes or stuff like that. But it's up to them. If the, it, it, it's, it, and it's a big discussion we have internally. It's like, do developers need to learn Kubernetes to be able to deploy stuff? And, and so all the ops teams say yes. And all the pragmatic people say, like, well, to me, it's more important people using the platform than people learning Kubernetes. If we can abstract and you can just worry about your application, it will be better. That's, that's what it's all about. It's the adoption. Now, if you want to do it, you can do it. And one of the things that happens is that if you run vanilla Kubernetes, most of the stuff that you do, it will work well. Trouble is when you have to do Bolt and certificates and these kind of things, but yeah, it is possible. I know that people do it, but it's up to the developer. Other questions? Yeah. What do you do for monitoring log aggregation? How do you manage that? Is that on-prem, or do you have that in the cloud as well? So logging, we have log stars that speeds up to CloudWatch. And monitoring, can we say what we do? Yeah. <laughs> we use <laughs> we, we use Sysdic on-prem. Yeah, we've got time for a couple more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the question is that that. In British Gas, they have ops, outsourced and, and local developers. Um, in our case, it's basically the other way around because it's ops, the one who's pushing for this. And I think that what happens with these people, these outsourcing companies, is that they don't know Kubernetes well enough, so they are very unsure, it's like, ooh. But the truth is that running Kubernetes is, from the ops point of view, better. Because you're basically separating all the problems that you have because of the application and, and the running the infrastructure are completely separated, right? So it, it is very different. And it's one of the good things of Kubernetes, like you will basically draw this line as like this is about my infrastructure and this is about my application and you can separate this very well. One more question. I think for your guys, you just get them to watch this video. And as he said, ops, it's better. Um, <laughs> last question. <laughs> In that case, we are not persisting data. We have EBS volumes and we have a data storage. But in that case, um, it was basically ephemeral data. So if it goes away, it's OK. But we have um, ways of, of doing Mongo. And we have another thing like Kafka with the composition thing. Um, if, if you run a test and then you have to create a result because the test happens in the Docker host, we don't have a way of saying, like, okay, um, how am I going to send this result back to whatever? So we have a prototype, which is basically another sidekick that will, your test will put the file somewhere and then the sidekick will get that file and put it in Kafka and someone else will worry about that file. And it's the same principle of decouple and just worry about what you have to do. You run your test. You don't have to worry about how to create a Kafka producer that is going to send stuff there. I said, you have to do this. Go and create a container that does that and create a sidekick container. It's a pattern that's working very well. 
because suddenly you just have to go and write your test, and if you want to send this somewhere, you just copy and paste this piece of YAML file and configure it accordingly, and that's it. Great. Well, I think that's about time for lunch. So, um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, the resources are here, and this is the answer to the poll. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you very much. You're welcome.